Thank you very much, Ritek. And I, I wanted to thank, thank the organizers, uh, both uh, for organizing and for inviting me to participate in this really spectacular uh, summer school. Um, so I wanted to um, tell you a story that's joint work I, before I just make sure they're on the board uh, with Harrison Chen, who's somewhere here, hopefully. Uh, he, he, no? No. Okay. There he goes. So hard questions go that way. Um, so join with Harrison Chen, David Helm, and David Nadler. Um, and so what is, our, what is the story uh, we want to talk about? Uh, my, our, the goal in my talk is to try to bridge kind of two different realms of the local Langlands correspondence, um, two different ways of formulating what local Langlands correspondence should be about. And we, try to, we want to present a mechanism of relating the two of them in some settings. So uh, maybe just some notation that G is going to be connected um, and a reductive group. Um, I'm going to be very lazy a lot of the time and assume it's split. Maybe a lot of things you can assume only quasi-split. Some things are more general, but I, I want to in indicate some principles that I think you can see already in, in the split case. Uh, and F is going to be uh, a local field. Okay, so um, what is the, the story? So one thing that we've heard a lot about in this summer school, so in the lectures of, of Dot and Zhu and Emerton, G and Hellman and Farg and Schulze is this idea of a, a categorical version of local Langlands correspondence. And I want to add an adjective there. In all of these talks, um, the field F was uh, a non-Archimedean. And the categorical, the kind of category you get was a, was a category of coherent sheaves. So the kind of general format uh, that we saw, again, in, in many talks, was the idea that you have some category of coherent sheaves on some stack, let me call it L, just to be very vague, some stack of Langlands parameters, or maybe I, L maybe stands for Langlands, maybe I can think of it as some stack of local systems of some kind, but some, some space of local systems or Galois representations. And what uh, the format of these conjectures said is that we can think of uh, representations of G of F, so we mean smooth representations of this group. And um, yeah, so we look at a category of smooth representations and there's this kind of conjecture of, uh, I don't know, sometimes called A, that there's a fully faithful embedding into a category of coherent sheaves on Langlands parameters. Okay. So that was the format in, in these talks of what you might call categorical coherent local Langlands correspondence. Okay. Um, I'm uh, going to be very, just a caveat, there's going to be lots of uh, technical things I'm not going to be trying to be careful about. In particular, I'm not going to be careful about size issues, whether I talk about coherent or kind of large versions like quasi-coherent or incoherent sheaves. I'm just going to use co to symbolize just kind of a, a general symbol for that. We can say more precise things if there's questions. Um, okay, so we, we want to embed representations into coherent sheaves, and um, in um, the farg schulze lectures, we heard in some settings there's much stronger statements you can make. You can think about these representations naturally sitting inside of some big automorphic category uh, that should be conjecturally equivalent to coherent sheaves. So there should be a counterpart to this, which is, let me just kind of schematically say, as sheaves on some automorphic space bund G. So this is a, a, form, a picture of the farg schulze conjecture, or there's in, in Xin Wen Zhu's work, there's a different models of what you might take here. Um, and again, what you should think of this is, is this is some kind of union. It's a, it has a semi-orthogonal decomposition. It's a kind of union of representations of some infinite family of groups, um, which are labeled by uh, these isocrystals or whatever. So it's an infinite, so we have this small category we're most interested in. We put it inside of this infinite family of groups, this kind of semi-orthogonal decomposition, and we get, um, this is supposed to be equivalent to coherent sheaves on Langlands parameters. Okay. Is that okay? That's kind of supposed to be executive summary of a theme. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do today is I'd like to do a couple of things, um, okay, maybe, maybe just to, to illustrate just uh, an example, just to have something concrete on the board. This appeared in Jean-Francois's talks in particular and in others. Uh, there's a space, let me call it, say, L, U. This is kind of the tame uh, unipotent 
uh, Unipo and Langlands parameters, again for non Archimedean field. Uh, so example of, just to give a picture of what these stacks of Langlands parameters look like, this is, looks like something like pairs of sigma in the, in the dual group and n uh, in the nilpotent cone inside of the Lie algebra, uh, where sigma acts on n by multiplication by q, which is the residue field cardinality uh, up to conjugation. Okay, this is just a, a picture. These, so, so these spaces of Langlands parameters, at least in some small chunks, like this unipotent chunk, uh, are not too scary. I mean, they're things you can write down concretely. Uh, and then in Jean-Francois' talk, we heard how the whole spaces, in some cases, can be understood in terms of these pieces. Uh, uh, yes? Um, um, let me just say, so this is where the kind of the Iwahori block sits. So for example, if you look at Langlands parameters for representations with an Iwahori fixed vector, they factor through the tame quotient of the Galois group. And here I'm assuming, moreover, that, uh, that you have rather than a sigma and a, I don't know what letter I'm supposed to use. Um, so this is the Frobenius, this is the generator of uh, tame inertia, and I want that to, to be nilpotent rather than uh, log of it to be nilpotent rather than arbitrary, okay? So, the, okay, is that, great. Um, so uh, I'd like to tell you two things. Um, the main content of the talk, I want to kind of propose a mechanism, if you like, not exactly, but roughly a mechanism to pick out this small chunk out of this big category, or pick out something that's relatively close to this. So if you're studying these coherent sheaves on the space of Langlands parameters, how do you pick out this very small piece out of it? Or at least I won't be able to do quite that, but I'll be pick out something relatively close to it. That, that's one kind of, in, in a kind of a geometric way. So what's a geometric mechanism to pick out something like this? Um, I'll say it more precisely later. Uh, for me, my involvement in this uh, all started from uh, work I was doing with David Nadler. Um, and maybe I just wanted to, a long time ago, so this is around 2007, we formulated something which, you know, you in his, a historically might say some version, some kind of real analog of the far conjecture. It's not exactly, I can explain some of the deficits uh, compared to the far conjecture, but I want to do a, an analog of this picture where F is now Archimedean. So just to, to fill in in, in, our, in, our, in the workshop, what can we do uh, when F is Archimedean? Um, and there's a picture that's basically the words the words are basically sound exactly the same. So maybe I should just write, here it is. Uh, okay, now uh, that's a, a kind of too obnoxious. So let's, um, what is the analog of the farg fontaine curve? In this case, uh, we learned from uh, Schultz and Farg that, that there's a natural analog of the farg fontaine curve, which I'll denote, I think the notation they use is this P1R. This is called the twister P1, or the twister line. Um, this is, uh, I don't know, we didn't use those words then. This is just, if you'd like, you take CP1 and you give it the real structure, the kind of non-split real structure. You use the antipodal map uh, as the real form. So if you like, the quotient is RP2. I just usually think of this as just RP2. Okay. Um, the quotient of CP1 by the antipodal map. But you can think of it as this complex curve with a real structure which has no real points. Um, so that's going to be, so this is, um, there's all kinds of reasons to think that this is the Archimedean analog of the farg fontaine curve. And then you can study um, this, now you can say all the words the same. So we can look at, so here's the kind of conjecture um, from, from 2007, and you could call, I guess you could call it, you know, maybe twister Langlands, twister geometric Langlands. It's geometric, it's just a geometric Langlands conjecture on this curve, and it says that sheaves, some, some suitable version of sheaves, I guess, no, we don't have the least sheaves, we have these Betty sheaves, which is a much more naive thing. Uh, you look at G bundles. Uh, so here G is my complex group, but it has a real involution. So G theta, theta is a real structure on my complex reductive group. And I look at bundles on this real curve that are real for this. So, so now, theta is the same as the uh, no, theta is on the group. Ah, sorry. So, so I have a group G, I'm using G for the complex group and theta is the real structure on it. And I'm looking at bundles on P1 that when you imply the antipodal involution are isomorphic to their theta conjugate. 
So that's a real bundle on this real curve. So I look at real bundles on this real curve. Now the main diff, you know, one of the main deficits or I don't know, differences with the kind of Farg conjecture is I'm going to add a point. I'm going to have tame ramification at one point. So I'm kind of Iwahori level structure. So I have a bundle with a reduct with a flag at one point. That's something that didn't appear in the Farg story. Uh, I can say later why. Anyway, the geometric Langlands conjecture in this case says that this should be equivalent to, again, let me call it co, really should write some int co, but I'm going to be lazy. Um, and you write the same space, Langlands parameters um, on this RP2. So what does this mean? Uh, I have sigma is the involution. So I, I should have said I want theta to be quasi-split. And so it induces an involution just combinatorily on the dual group. So sigma is as algebraic automorph involution on the dual group. I look at local systems on P1, CP1 that are, um, um, that are equivariant for this conjugation. Okay, and again, with a pole at one point and a flag preserving the monodromy. Okay, so this is, this is all spelled out in the notes, but I just wanted to write down the formula I think of this as really local systems on the Mobius strip. It's RP2 minus the point. You have a Mobius strip and you have some, some monodromy there. Sigma is sigma? Uh, so sigma is the involution. So sigma is the involution of, of, of G check that's dual to the real conjugation of, of G, just combinatorially. So I can say this in terms of the L group. Probably better to think about this in terms of the L group, but, but I, I, I won't. Okay, so this is uh, this conjecture. Uh, I'm not so it, this looks a lot like the like this, and uh, one of the main points that I wanted to say is that inside of here, why did we want to study this space? Is the same kind of idea. So in the Farg story, you had a locus, which is the kind of the trivial bundle locus, which is point mod g of f. You had an object whose automorphisms was g of f. So here you might hope to a version. We have point mod g of r. And you might try to imitate the same thing, except that then you would need some crazy category of sheaves. You probably need to say words like liquid that I don't understand. You need some category of sheaves such that sheaves on point mod a real group looks like, you know, things like discrete series, like big infinite dimensional representations. I don't know that story. Um, but what you can do is inside of here, there's a trivial bundle locus. Instead of being point mod the real group, you have the flag variety, the complex flag variety mod the real group. Maybe I should be a little more careful. Maybe it's G mod N. I'm going to be a little, in, okay, you get G mod N, you can cut down to G mod B. So, in, and so inside of this space, you have not point mod the group, but flag variety mod the group, which is great because there's a whole history in representation theory, balance and Bernstein localization. And in particular, there's a version of balance and Bernstein uh, due to uh, Kashiwara and Schmidt, kind of a, a, a real analog of, of Bales and Bernstein, that tells you that this category is very closely related. I, and again, I can say more precisely later, but it's very closely related to Harishandra modules. Let me just call it smooth representations of this real group. So you have some subcategory that's very close to representation of the real group sitting as a piece in here. There's a semi orthogonal decomposition with all kinds of similar looking pieces, but this sits inside of here as a full subcategory. So this conjecture kind of looks a lot like those things. Okay, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, you could say that, I mean, I'm just saying, I look at uh, bundles on P1 and I choose a flag at one point, a reduction to Borel. Yeah, sh sure, yeah. Uh, if I knew the words log better, I would say it that way, but uh, yeah. So it's bundles with parabolic structure. So. And here the same thing is parabolic local systems. Uh, yes, but, I, but can I do it later? Uh, yeah. I'll say more precise things. So th this category, if you'd like, maybe this category roughly looks like the category of Harishandra modules or kind of rep representation here, but, but kind of collapsed by translation functors. So that category has extra symmetry, which is translation functions that shift infinitesimal character. So this category, in some sense, doesn't depend on infinitesimal category, character in the Lie algebra, but a version in the group. So it's roughly a collapsed version of that category. If you fix infinitesimal character, you can get out of this exactly categories of representation at a fixed infinitesimal character. 
Uh, and you have to be careful about singular. This is discussed in the notes, but yeah. Okay. So um, now I, I, why am I, I wanted to put this out here just to, to get something Archimedean, but really it's going to be just a, not, a good example for the mechanism I want to describe. Um, one, one point I want to make is just like in the unipotent case above, this space of local systems, I wrote some big formula for it, it's something super simple and concrete. It's, um, you know, it's a local systems on a Mobius strip with a flag and you start thinking what that means, it becomes something extremely simple. It's an element, you can write it as an element delta in the dual group such that delta times its sigma conjugate lies in a fixed Borel. So it's really a pair delta and a Borel and with this one equation up to conjugation. That's what this space is. So it's a very concrete uh, stack, nothing derived about it if you want, it's just a simple space. That's the analog of the stack of Langlands parameters we're proposing. Yeah. It's a, you fix a quasi-split form, and as I'll explain later, you know, this is something that goes long back, you know, you will see representation theory, if you say it's G is semi-simple, or you be careful, but you see representation theory of all these, a whole bunch of forms in the same stack. So it's not really a story about quasi-split forms, but that's a way to get, get a place. That's a way to write this module I stuff. But, yes? Well, this is a geometric Langlands conjecture, right? So it has the same status as geometric Langlands conjectures in general. There's a lot of stuff you could say. There's a spectral action. These are things we know, you know, there's a spectral action one side or the other. You can use that spectral action to construct functors by acting on a Whitaker object. Um, we have a preprint that's been around for, in, in some Dropbox for a while where you prove this in the case of SL2, just as kind of a reality check, because there are, things are small enough that David is able to calculate everything. So. Uh, I don't know, but uh, it's very close to work of his with Jiwei. And, um, you, you, you're now able to calculate some of these categories. Because this is, again, it's P1. It's not a higher genus geometric language conjecture. You, you can label all the objects, and you might hope to just match them. But So it should be easier than a general geometric language conjecture, but it's, but it, yeah. And it's, so you can write functors, I think, but that's not what. Uh... OK, anyway. Um, this is where, this is, I wanted to put this out there as just to have an Archimedean counterpart. Um, but also because I'm going to, this concrete space is going to be very useful for the mechanism I want to describe. But, uh, okay, so uh, this is going to happen a couple of times in this talk. You've gotten lost uh, at this point. Uh, you can wake up now. I want to, uh, I want to take you back a long, a long time ago uh, to week one of this workshop. Um, so in the week one of this workshop, uh, we lectures of uh, Olivia Taibbi and Lucas Mason Brown. Um, and then I want to take you back uh, a little further to 1993. Um, so this is a uh, Vogan uh, paper in 1993 about the local Langlands conjecture. Uh, and I want to describe um, a, a picture of the local Langlands correspondence that long before we, these kind of words were appearing, how did people think about it? What, this is what uh, Olivier Taibier described as the, the refined, called the refined local Langlands course conjecture. Um, so what did that conjecture say? So you look at smooth, irreducible representations. Uh, what does Langlands, local Langlands say? You look at smooth, irreducible representations of G of F. And Langlands tells you this, we're supposed to attach to them Langlands parameters. Uh, and I'm not going to be careful about dual groups and C groups and whatever, but anyway, there's a map to Langlands parameters. And with the fiber over, a so this is some Galois representation, a Vey representation. So the fiber over here is, uh, that's the L packet. And that's a, def a definition. And the refined local Langlands conjecture says that these fibers you can describe. Namely, these are going to be irreducible representations uh, of some quotient of, uh, which was written in Olivia's talk, which, but it's quotient of the group of components of the centralizer. Let me call it G check of row. I'm just gonna, I just like the not G check of row, this notation just for the centralizer of row. I don't know, so I don't keep writing Zs. Okay, so it's a representation of the quotient that parameterizes the L packet. Um, so this is the, this kind of refinement of local language correspondence. And Vogan 
in his uh, article proposed, and I think this has also been come up, but that we should um, we get a slightly nicer picture by, um, in particular, I want to, to drop this quotient. Just want to get representations of this, this uh, a bigger collection of, of objects that no longer looks like smooth representations of, of G of F. This looks like, uh, now uh, this gives a representation of some collection of forms. I don't know, let's just call it theta i. So this is some collection of these pure, pure inner forms, forms uh, of, of my group. So if I consider not a single group at once, but a small, now notice this is a small kind of finite collection of forms. If I consider this, this collection together, I get a slightly nicer picture. Uh, in particular, I get just these representations. So this is what I, this is kind of Vogan's picture. And why does um, Vogan like this, clustering this together? Many reasons, but one reason, uh, just geometrically. So this data has a natural geometric interpretation. And, and what is that natural geometric interpretation, it looks like the data that defines equivariant local systems. So the, so the point is that um, representations of a centralizer are exactly the representation of, so maybe let's, let's, let's just make a, if I have a representation of a, of a, of a, of a centralizer, of G check of rho, you can think of this as an equivariant coherent sheaf uh, on the orbit of rho. But a representation of the um, component group, that's exactly the data that describes an equivariant local systems, local system on the orbit. So what's really going on in this uh, refined local language is we're saying, let's look at equivariant local systems on the orbit, or if you'd like, local system on a stack of language parameters, but just sitting on that orbit. And then Vogan says, oh, well, we know what to do if you have a local system on an orbit. We should extend it to a perverse sheep or a constructible complex of some kind. And so these objects sit inside of some natural constructible category of sheaves on spaces of language parameters. So what... Um, so uh, now let me, so, yeah, so, so the kind of the picture is, is that I should, um, the picture that Vogan gets out of this is I should relate, I, I should study, um, study these uh, representations um, together uh, via constructible sheaves, constructible sheaves on the stack of Langlands parameters. Um, that's, so these, the simple objects and categories of co constructible sheets will look like equivariant local systems, will be parameterized by equivariant local systems on an orbit. Now, what do I mean by stack of Langlands parameters? The stacks are different than the ones that appeared. So Jean-Francois explained um, that when we want to talk about these big stacks of Langlands parameters, it's very important to let, say, Frobenius not act semi-simply, to drop that hypothesis in order to get a nice moduli space. In this Vogan story, we're, we're not dropping that. Frobenius is acting semi-simply, or the, there's some semi-simplicity on the Vey group, but we're gonna be fixing, the, fixing some, all the continuous parameters. So in this representation theory story, there's some continuous parameters, some action of a center, or um, Bernstein center, or center of enveloping algebra, or other side, you have things like eigenvalues of Frobenius. We're gonna work at a fixed parameter. And what Vogan suggests is that representation theory, um, so this is representation theory at fixed uh, parameter. And these parameters, uh, you know, this Vogan calls the infinitesimal character in general. When you study a fixed parameter, these representations should be, can be accessed through this. And there's a very beautiful series of uh, pictures of how you could use this to get things like describe the Grundy group of representations, extensions between representations, uh, standard objects, the relations. Okay, um, so this is what I want to say is, is uh, some version of what I want to call the, um, 
the kind of um, arch the constructible local Lang lens correspondence. So this is was here was a coherent local Lang lens correspondence. But there's this kind of older story, um, which is so let's say constructible sheaves on a space of Lang lens correspondence for some fixed parameter. Let me just call that parameter. I don't know, so kind of lambda. This lambda, lambda is not supposed to have some particular meaning. This is just to remind you that here I'm looking at uh, Langlands parameters with some fixed eigenvalues of Frobenius or some fixed infinitesimal character. So they're not the same stacks; they're smaller stacks, but and constructible sheaves, and should correspond um, to uh, now uh, represent union of representations but only of pure inner forms. So here's really actually direct sum of pure inner forms. So a finite collection of groups rather than this infinite collection of groups. And this is what I'd like to call the kind of constructible local Langlands correspondence. Okay. So one can make this, there's various versions of this. So if you look at uh, Lucas Mason Brown's notes, he exp explains there the, the adams barbish vogan picture for real groups. Um, and the adams barbish vogan uh, they slightly, they have to be careful, you have to be careful exactly what you mean by this space to get the right, to make it, you have to add a little bit of unipotence to make the, to get the right space that has these nice interesting geometry. But, um, but this is, this is exactly the, what uh, adams barbish vogan kind of carried out this Vogan vision in the Archimedean setting. Oh, yeah, so uh, yeah, so this is also representations with some fixed parameter lambda. Good. Um, so, and, and in fact, so Adams, Barbage, Vogan and didn't make any categorical statements, but there is a statement of this. This is really, again, supposed to be a, a, a categorical equivalence. In the real case, this was formulated by, by, by Sergal. It's really going to be some equivalence of derived categories between representations and now constructible sheaves on Langlands parameters. I think such things are known in various cases in the Piatic setting, mainly due to works of, of Lustig and Solveld and others. So let me put here Lustig certainly should be mentioned in this context. But um, I haven't seen a very general conjecture of this point. I don't know, maybe just don't know the literature enough. But this is definitely something that's expected. And so what I'd like to, to do is try to relate these two rows. This is the constructible local language correspondence. It's basically a, a very, it's a, almost just this, so, you know, rep of GF sits inside of both. But here it's, you know, almost everything. This is small collection. Here it's a much, much bigger thing. And the question is, how do you cut down from here to here? Of course, uh, I think, uh, you know, in, in the Farg Schultz lectures, we, they tell you how to do it on one side. You just restrict, you could just restrict to an open piece. These forms are some of the GBs. There's an open locus in Bungie, and you just restrict. So maybe I want to tell you what to put on this side. Okay. Um, my inclusion? Oh, I didn't write lambda. Yeah, sorry. So this rep at a fixed lambda sits inside of here. Okay, sorry. This was maybe too, this was supposed to be a schematic picture. Yeah, if I look at representations at a fixed lambda, at a fixed infinitesimal character, I can think of them inside of here. I, could, I mean, I can fix infinitesimal character here too. I mean, I can just impose it. So maybe I shouldn't write it this way, just to be careful. But there's this picture for fixed infinitesimal character in using constructible sheaves. There's a picture for arbitrary representations using coherent sheaves, and I'd like to sort of try to relate the two. Okay. Um, any questions? That's a, yeah, that's a, right. Thank you. Uh, so that's somehow one of the problems in the, in the ABV uh, picture, in, in Vogan's picture, is that the spaces that you're studying, depending on, there are these spaces of language parameters you study, and they vary very poorly. They don't, they're not kind of continuous in lambda. So the kind of conjecture that formulated in, in Vogan don't make sense in families. So this story is kind of a families version. That's somehow one of the, you know, we also learned that's one of the motivations of this, is for studying families. This doesn't make sense for families. Uh, the spaces just don't continue. And again, this is the same issue, I'll, I'll get to it later, what appeared in Jean-Francois' talk, why you need Frobenius to have not required to be semi-simple. You just don't get a nice space this way. 
those, you know, spaces, semi-simple, the semi-simple locus is, is a bad locus if you vary the eigenvalues. So that's basically what, what we're going to do, is going to add the unipotence. Okay. Um, so um, I want to switch gears soon uh, into a, so I'll, I'll wake you up in a couple minutes to a very different topic. But for now, uh, before I, to, 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 to do some derived algebraic geometry. But for now, let me just do one more, a little bit more of rep theory, um, just to give you maybe what this ABV story looks like more concretely. So I said there is a space. Let me, let me write down those spaces. Um, what is the story, again, in the real setting? Uh, and before that, let me, maybe you could say, uh, if you're like me and you get lost in the zoo of, of different uh, forms of groups, you might say, where do, what are these pure inner forms? Where do they come from? This is explained in Olivia's talk. Let me explain a geometric, a geometric way, um, which explained, for example, very nicely in an uh, article of Bernstein. Like, why, are, why, are, why should we be studying not representations of a single group, but a collection of groups? And there's a nice answer. One answer is this, that um, suppose I have a group G, and I have some Galois actions, so I have some finite group. Well, I don't know. I have a group action on G. I'm thinking about the real case, so I think of this as Z mod 2. And, uh, and, let me, and here I'm thinking about this you know, as really being the, maybe a, this, my real involution. And one thing you could ask is uh, representations, so representations of, of G of the fixed points. Well, okay, I don't know, I guess I call them the real group, G, the fixed points. I mean, I can think of that as relating to, if you like, to the stack point mod this group. So geometrically, okay, there's an interesting stack, which is a classifying stack of a group. That has to do with representations here of that group. But there's something else you can do, which is instead of taking point mod this group, I, I could take point mod G and take the fixed points of theta. So there's a notion of homotopy fixed points or fixed points on a stack. And if you think, what are the fixed points of this involution on, or let me just call it gamma. Right? What are the fixed points of a group on point mod G? And the answer is not point mod the stabilizer. That sits in, inside as a connected component. But what you get is exactly this union over pure inner forms, uh, forms, um, let me call it theta i, of point mod G theta i. So if you like, you can take this as a definition of where pure inner forms are coming from. They're just studying, if you study equivariant geometry, if you study your group studying from the, say, the group of the algebraic closure, and you work geometrically, you're naturally going to end up with this collection of groups. So that's somehow why this is going to be very natural to look at this. It just comes from the geometry. You don't have to put it in by hand. OK. Um, so what is the, this adams barbish vogan uh, parametrization, lang space of Langlands parameters, and let me give uh, a non-traditional formulation uh, that's in that different reformulation of it. Uh, the traditional one you can see in, in Lucas's notes. Um, so, and let me just, to, for, to be simple, I can, uh, let me just put trivial infinitesimal character. I can, can vary the infinitesimal character later if you want. But, what is the adams varbish stack, the stack of Langlands parameter? Um, so I have this, again, I have this algebraic involution G of G check. Um, that's involution that's, that's, again, that's involution that's dual to my real form, to my quasi-split real form theta. And I'm just going to look at, I'm going to look at the union over um, the kind of pure inner forms of sigma. Sigma i are, you know, like forms of sigma uh, of, I look at the flag variety for the dual group, and I mod out by um, the corresponding symmetric subgroups. Or if you like, you could call it k sub sigma. These are symmetric subgroups of G check, which are the fixed points of this collection of involutions. So we have a collection of involution that should all be considered together in a family. And this is the space on which you should be studying constructible sheets. Adams Barbish Vogel say it slightly differently, but it's equivalent to that. Um, let me say it even as even kind of uh, simpler version way of saying it. I look at the flag variety twice, two copies of flag variety. I'm going to mod out by the diagonal action. This is you know thing we usually just 
easier to just write down as double cosets, but look at this space. And this has an action of Z mod 2, or action of gamma, where I combine the action on the group and flipping the factors. That's why I wrote it this way. And this is just the fixed point for that. Okay. So the Adams Barbish Morgan space you can write down in one, in one line, it's this. It's the fixed points of gamma on double cosets. That's what appears for trivial central character. That's the stack on which constructible sheaves are supposed to describe Harishandra modules. So, you know, so um, Harishandra modules for this whole inner class. Um, so uh, do my notations make sense? Um, OK, so, so I, can, I, I don't know if people really are unhappy by some people will be unhappy by not having any general interest. I can write the general one, but I think it just adds a little notation. So you, again, you can look at my notes for the, for the general version. Um, and so what this, what this means is, what is the category, the constructible, constructible real local language conjecture, constructible local language conjecture over, over F Archimedean, AKA Sorgel's conjecture. Um, it just says that if I look at the, um, Direct sum over this theta i in this inner pure inner class. Can you clarify what you mean by trivial representational character? Oh, probably not. No, but uh, Alexandra isomorphism, for example, which point is that? Uh, I think I want the trivial representation. The point of the trivial representation, so it's wrong. So yeah. It's not going to be fixed by the value. Yeah, yeah, I want non singular. <laughs> Integral non singular. Um, okay, uh, and if you uh, there's very nice notes of Yanis Sikilaridis where he works this out. Uh, um, um, so, okay, so now, um, so what is Sorgel's conjecture? So I look at this theta in this, I don't know, let me just, and this is my notation for my pure, this pure inner forms. And again, this is a geometric thing. It's this collection of, if you like, fixed points, pure inner forms. I look at the Harishandra modules or representations with some fixed central character, let's say generalized infinitesimal character, let's I'm here I'm doing zero, you can put something more general, of this G theta i. So the category that you're interested on the automorphic side, uh, representation here this means Harishandra modules, if you like, is supposed to be equivalent, or this is this kind of causal duality equivalence to just constructible sheaves on the ABV space, which I'm gonna write in this very concise form. Um, so this is this is um, this is the real constructible local language conjecture. Okay, um, and if you remember, I mentioned this Kashiwara Schmidt story. Kashiwara Schmidt says that this also has a geometric description. Representations of a group by a version of Balance and Bernstein can be thought of as sheaves on flag varieties for that group. Right here, it's flag varieties for the dual group. This is Langlands parameters. Uh, actually, if you think of what this says, this is supposed to be sheaves on the flag variety for G, again, fixed points. So actually, Sorgel's conjecture becomes this very beautiful looking thing. It's a duality between sheaves on flag varieties for G and duality of sheaves on flag varieties for G dual. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so in the Kashiwara Schmidt story, we're looking at a really constructible equivalent, the constructible derived, everything is derived, by the way. Sorry, everything is derived, caveat. Um, yeah, so it means the constructible derived category or the large version, the end version, if you're, I don't know, I, I promise not to worry about size. Um, yeah, so in the complex case, in the, for complex groups, you just remo remove the gamma. That's the case of complex groups, and that's a theorem of, of Sorgel reinterpretation of, of, uh, of Balance and Ginsburg, uh, Balance and Ginsburg and Sorgel. Uh, this is in the complex case for f equals the complex numbers. So duality between flag varieties for Langlands dual groups. Okay. All right. Um, so that's, I just, um, okay. So I don't know. I, for representation theorists, I wanted to at least have something sp specific written on the board involving representations of real groups. Uh, are there questions before I change gears? Uh, 
uh, Bells and Ginsberg circle is this statement without the gammas. So Bells and Ginsberg circle tells you that if you look at the finite Hecke category, so the derived category of G mod B mod B, and the derived category of G dual mod B dual mod B dual, they're equivalent, or the equivalent in the sense of causal duality means there's a graded lift that are equivalent, or you can, or they're equivalent up, equivalent up to fussing with grading. Let's let's just say it that way. Um, Okay. And that, that equivalent up to fussing with grading is, in the real case, what gives you this Vogan character duality, why the, the, the duality between Grundy groups rather than isomorphism. But, um, okay. Yeah, now you could say, so okay, what's going to happen soon is I'm going to, to replace constructible sheaves by D modules. All of the stacks that are going to appear in my story are going to be these kind of finite orbit stacks. And so I can, and all the, all the D modules will be regular holonomic. So when you say sheaves, again, Giannis' question, Sheaves, I could say, in the, in the complex case, I could just say D modules. In the real case, I have to be careful what do I mean. This equivalence for a real group. On this side, you could just say D modules without blinking. Yeah, so you can, by sheaves, I mean a kind of constructible version of sheaves, either the constructible derived category or D modules. And they'll be the same in all the examples. So I'm going to just identify those words. Okay. Other? Okay. All right, so now, um, now other group of people can wake up. Uh, I want to do a complete gear shift. Um, I want to explain a paradigm for how to relate these two um, via, uh, via circle actions uh, in derived algebraic geometry. So what I'm going to spend uh, much of my next, I hope I get somewhere else, but uh, in any case, for, the, for a while now, we're going to be doing uh, some, some uh, nice derived algebraic geometry. Okay. Um, okay, and, and so let me maybe at least say the, the structure that we want to get out of derived algebraic geometry. Um, and the structure I want to get is the following. Let me just, so let me write it very schematically. Um, so the paradigm will be, I'm going to get something, a circle action. I, I'll have to tell you what do I mean by the circle, what do I mean by an action, uh, but <laughs> anyway. Uh, but this is a, so it's a kind of a paradigm uh, as we're going to get some um, version of a circle which is going to act on my category of coherent sheaves on these Langlands parameters in some settings. And now one of the things that gives you, whatever this is, when you have a group acting, you can look at equivariant things. So I can look at this coherent sheaves and I look at equivariant sheaves. Um, now, this is now, uh, so if this category was, you know, was K linear, K is my field of coefficients, and I should maybe write once and for all that everything is going to be living over a field K of characteristic zero, and really I think of K as being the complex numbers. So, I don't know, so you might as well take K to be complex numbers. Nothing piatic going on here. So, but K is going to be characteristic zero field. So, when you think about Equivariance for anything, this is always going to be, if this is k-linear, this is linear over um, k of bs1. It'll, it'll, it's a natural field of coefficients. Let me, I'll explain where this comes from. Or cochains on bs1, and maybe I can just think of it, cochains on bs1 with k coefficients, which is isomorphic to polynomials in one variable. Okay. I'll explain this. I'm just trying to say what happens out of this mechanism is I'll get a category that's now depends on a new variable. So it's a deformation. The degree of U is one? Uh, degree of U, so the degree, degree of U is going to be two. So this is the cohomology of CP infinity. Um, and so it's polynomials in a variable of degree two. I'm not going to fuss too much about the degree. I think of this as just a one parameter deformation. So you can think of this um, mechanism as giving you a one parameter deformation. Now, what can you do with this deformation? I could do two things. I can specialize to u equals zero. Sorry. Yes. Uh, it, yeah, it, it, I'm, I'm calling it equivariant sheaves. So it's so it's invariant objects in the kind of derived set. So you say that the yes. Yes. Exactly. Um, yeah. So it's homotopy fixed points, if you like, or uh, just think of equivariant sheaves. So if you have a category depending on a parameter, so this depends on a parameter u in some graded version of a1. And um, 
if I set this u to zero, I'm going to, in other words, I take this equivariant sheaves and I tensor over k of u with k. Um, so that's what I'll call, uh, in, if you'd like, invariant sheaves. The key point is that this is going to be a full subcategory of what I had before. That's a general principle, uh, a general statement that this deformation, when you specialize to zero, you don't get the whole category. So it's not actually a deformation of the entire category, it's a deformation of some full subcategory. So the claim is some full subcategory of this is going to deform over u, and when u is generic, so really, I can't really sp special, I want to say u equals one, that doesn't quite make sense, I, I have to invert u. Um, so u is generic, I look at this coherent category, and I tensor over k of u with k of u u inverse. When you invert, the, what you'll get is this constructible category. Um, is what I was calling sheaves, the constructible category of sheaves. Um, but now, well, okay, that didn't depend on ku inverse, and so I just can, if you like, add this, this u variable in some auxiliary way. So just the base change of this. Yeah. Uh, I, that's going to be the next topic. So, yeah, I, I, I'm going to. So I'm just trying to say whatever it is, this is what I want to get out of it. I'm, whatever this one action is, it's going to give me a full subcategory and a deformation of that full subcategory, which generically will give me the constructible sheaves. So this is going to be this paradigm. Some full subcategory of coherent sheaves will get this U deformation, which generically will give these guys. Yeah. Yeah, so to the, uh, no, so there, yeah, there's two things you could do. So this thing makes sense on the into big L. This deformation makes sense over the big L. Once you specialize an infinitesimal character, you'll get some identification of this. So this is for each infinitesimal character. So I mean, the nice thing is you get a category that doesn't depend on infinitesimal category. So if you'd like, it's a family's version of the constructible category. In, in the sense that whenever I specialize the infinitesimal character, character, I'll identify this junk with constructible sheaves. Uh, so this is not a general theorem about F1 equivalence. It's almost. Uh, so there's a very beautiful general statement that I'll say. So I would, I would of, want to specialize to lambda. So this category makes sense. And this, once you fix lambda, fix lambda will give this sheaves, so uh, this sheaves to lambda, this constructible category. For lambda. I'll state all these things more precisely. I just wanted to have a kind of picture of what, what I'm going to get at. So, yeah. Oh, uh, no, because I just couldn't decide on, I don't know, is it con? I don't know. You, you choose D modules. Maybe I'll let me call it D modules. So, really, it's naturally going to be about D modules. Is, but yeah, okay. So, just to add an, an, a third notation to confuse everyone. Um, Okay, so that's the structure I want to present. So I want to say uh, some abstract nonsense, some general story about it, and then hopefully I'll have some time at the end, and I'll spell out in the examples, in these kind of examples, exactly what happens, how this, how this. So I want to, I want to explain, for example, is how these, these kind of Zorgel conjectures follow from this geometric Langlands type conjectures by S1 equivariant localization. Okay, um, so. But this story is really for me, for David Nadler and me, I think this is where we first decided we needed to learn derived algebraic geometry. We were thinking about this representation theory problem. And you look at one side and there was some geometric circle. So on, the, on CP1, there's an action of a circle. You know, the usual, you can rotate and it fixes the two poles. It's an honest circle action. Now you follow like some of these geometric language equivalents, it's like the Zerukamnikov's theorem. You look at the other side and you say, wait, there's supposed to be some circle action on these space of Langlands parameters. Those space of Langlands parameters, where there's nothing derived about them. They're just these concrete little stacks I wrote down, you know, deltas and flags with some equation. There's no S1 symmetry out there. This is where you need derived algebraic geometry to see this some kind of, something that on the automorphic side in the real case is really just a manifest rotation symmetry. On the spectral side is somehow much more derived. Yeah, because I was I was cheating. I mean, it's a it's a graded A one. Maybe you should say A one mod GM. I mean, if you have an extra, you should really think. 
Yeah, okay. Um, Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so U is, a, is an element in degree two. This, a, this affine line is a line of degree two. If you have things that have some auxiliary kind of mixed structure, some auxiliary GM actions, you can, decide, you can shift that two back to zero. So there's this various games you can play with this degree. But the affine line, the deformations that I'm going to construct are naturally live over a base of degree two. And, yeah. And this fits with the fact that you are using the assumption that K is zero. Yeah, in, in, right. In, Otherwise, you have to think much more smartly. Yep. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, just, I just meant that I look, it's, it's, that's a terrible notation. I just meant sheaves on the space of Langlands parameters for fixed lambda. So I'm not fixed. So I had these spaces of Langlands parameters, and they have, a, you know, in the, in the unipotent case, there's this eigenvalues of Frobenius. There's a big space where I let those vary. There's a small space where I fix them. That's right. So I'm saying, if you look at co S1 of the entire space, it has this nice deformation, which one eigenvalue at a time gives you the constructible category. OK. All right, so now we shift. Um, when does my talk end? 1225. It always feels like there's a lot of time when someone else is speaking, and then, you know, you see, you see. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, all right. So now I want to talk, tell you a story about this um, story. Let me kind of give it a name. It's kind of loop spaces, the relation between loop spaces and D modules, or loop spaces and connections. So it's a story in derived algebraic geometry. Um, and um, it's really just a geometric, it's kind of a geometric interpretation. It's a geometric or derived geometric take on the theory of a Hochschild and cyclic homology. So the theory of Hochschild and cyclic homology has, which you may, won't need to know for this story, has a geometric interpretation that makes it sort of very cute. Um, so, uh, so first of all, I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm going, there are going to be no more constructible sheaves. I'm going to replace them with D modules. I'm going to study D modules. In the settings I'm interested in, those two will be the same. Okay. So what I'd like to understand is how to get um, D modules. So, you know, so if you look at, at what I've been talking about so far, I have some category of D modules on one side, and I have some category of, some category of coherent sheaves on a maybe different space, and you're supposed to relate them. So, if you, so how are you supposed to think? There's an obvious thing to say if you know something about D modules. The ring of differential operators is a deformation so the ring of differential operators is a deformation um, of, of, the, of the symmetric algebra of the tangent space. So here, so here x is going to be a smooth scheme uh, and characteristic 0. Um, uh, so it looks like the symmetric algebra of the tangent bundle. And this is just the Riesz construction. By deformation, I just mean this is the associated graded of D. Uh, and so there's a family over A1, which is the Riesz family, where, where at lambda equals 0, I get uh, the symmetric algebra of the tangent bundle, and away from 0, I get the ring of differential operators. Okay. So the ring of differential operators has an associated graded, which is symmetric algebra of the tangent bundle, which is functions on the cotangent bundle. So now pass to modules. Modules for differential operators sit in a natural Riesz family with quasi-coherent sheaves. So D modules have a natural uh, deformation to sheaves on the cotangent bundle. So that's um, the kind of theory, if you like. You can think about this arrow as deformation quantization. Um, or this arrow you can think of as just associated grid or micro-localization. There's a nice relation between geometry of D modules, or sheaves in general, and the geometry of the cotangent bundle. So that's a basic mechanism that relates, if you like, constructible sheaves to cotangent bundles, to coherent sheaves on a cotangent bundle. So that, at some level, that's all we're going to be doing. That's how we're going to pass between coherent and constructible. It's going to be some version of this. But it'll be, have to be an adapted version. Uh, does this make sense so far, everyone's? What I mean by the Riesz construction here? In, OK, uh, okay. So, so the basic idea is I'm, I can relate differential operators but with sheaves on the cotangent bundle. 
as a family over the affine line. And here it's really a graded affine line. It's an A1, which this is a GM equivariant family over A1. It's just a taking something filtered and deforming it. It's associated graded. Get a GM equivariant family over the line. Now, OK, that's the family I want to get. But there's a, a kind of a causal dual picture of this family that's going to be the way I'm going to actually, what I'm actually going to study. So there's a causal dual picture which is given by the theory of cyclic homology. So, um, so what do I mean by this causal duality? So um, I'm just going to replace, um, basically it's just uh, the, okay. So I'm going to replace the, the cotangent bundle of X uh, by uh, some shifted version of the tangent bundle of X. Now this is a fancy way of saying on the level of functions, here I looked at the symmetric algebra of the tangent space. This thing is built so that I get the exterior algebra on the cotangent space, aka differential forms. I'm going to be a little sloppy about plus versus minus degrees, but so, okay. But so the idea is that rather than thinking of symmetric algebra of the tangent space, you can think about the exterior algebra of the cotangent space, in other words, differential forms. And this thing has, um, now if you like, why am I calling this causal duality? If you look at modules for this, so if you look at sheaves on, uh, on this, so if I look at modules, for this algebra and modules for this algebra, these two are derived equivalent. Um, derived equivalent, and again, I, I have to be a little careful about adjectives, about size of, of modules, but there's some kind of standard yoga of how to write this. This is the causal duality of uh, um, who? Bernstein, Gelfand, Gelfand. Um, okay, so there's you can rewrite things instead of a tangent bundle using a cotangent bundle. Um, but really, what was I interested in? I was interested in deforming this to differential operators. This has, the, there's a natural deformation here, which is the Duram complex. Uh, you might say, where, where's a deformation in the Duram complex? I could just put a parameter lambda in front of the Duram differential. That's a family, which at zero gives me differential forms, at one gives me the usual Duram complex. So this is reconstruction for differential operators is dual to, to the Duram complex. Um, and so you can rewrite the whole theory of D modules and differential operators and so on. Instead of using differential operators, you don't need to ever talk about differential operators. You could just use the Duram complex. This is the usual story that a, a flat connection is given by an operator nabla uh, with the usual stuff. OK. So that's just a, it's just a fancy way of saying the usual thing. A flat connection is given by a connection operator. That's right. This is a DG algebra with trivial differential, and now I'm, I'm deforming that. I'm adding this Duram differential. So that's an interesting G algebra. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite things in terms of differential forms. And the um, this algebra of differential forms has this very beautiful um, source in derived algebraic geometry. There's a very beautiful picture of this, which again is an interpretation of cyclic. So Algebraically, differential forms can be dis so. This is an, what I want to tell you now is an interpretation of the statement that differential forms are isomorphic to the Hochschild homology of functions. Uh, this is known as the Hochschild constant Rosenberg theorem. So this has a geometric interpretation, which is what I want to explain. Uh, if you haven't seen Hochschild homology, you don't need to think about it for this. So what is this, so what, what is, how do I want to get, what is this saying? If I want to get differential forms, I can get them up to, and this is an, an annoying but sadly necessary part of the subject, because you have to change the degrees. You have to put them in uh, negative de degrees uh, rather than positive degrees like we usually think of the Durango. Think of this kind of homologically. And why do I want to think about them homologically? Because then I can get them as a tor. So here's the, the, you know, the formula. If I look at functions, the structure sheaf of the diagonal, so here I have the diagonal inside of x cross x. Again, x was my smooth scheme. If I look at functions on diagonal and I take their derived intersection with functions on the diagonal, 
over functions on x cross x, I get differential forms. So that's a, a way to get differential forms. Uh, so in, in derived algebraic geometry, you could, we just think of these rings as rings of coefficients. We just take spec. And what this is, so I take spec of this. Uh, yes, so this is, ends up being formal. Uh, so these statements are actually all true for x singular as well, where you replace tangent bundles by tangent complexes, and then, then there'll be differentials around. But in the smooth case, this is really just. Um, OK, so, so let me take spec of this. I'm, uh, I'm going to think about these as ring of functions or something. And what this is saying is that if I take the diagonal inside of x cross x, and I take its derived self-intersection, which I'll stop writing derived because I promised everything was derived. The self-intersection of the diagonal, that's a thing whose functions should be calculated by this. And the claim is that derived self, this statement is saying that the self-intersection of the diagonal is isomorphic to a shifted version of the tangent bundle. That's just names for this equality. OK. okay. Um, now, but so we're getting a differential forms, but something here, this is something kind of very fundamental. Self-intersection of the diagonal is something very fundamental. And so I'm going to give it another name. I'm going to call it the derived loop space of x. So this is called the derived loop space. Um, why is it called the derived loop space? Because it has a, a description as a loop space. So if you like, maybe let's write it, uh, write the writing diagonal. Let me write it. It's fiber product of x with itself over x cross x. That's a self-intersection diagonal. You can think about this as maps from, what is, what is this saying? You have two points in x. OK, this is x cross x. It's two points in x except that I want them to be on the diagonal, so they should be equal. But I also want them to be on the diagonal, so they should be equal. Right. So this is my S1. Okay. Okay, so, um, okay. I think Harrison wrote this nicely in his notes. You know, you can write this in some funny way like that. But um, anyway, it's two points that are glued over, that are glued twice. That's when you map from this to x, you get the self-intersection of the diagonal. Now, so this is the circle. So what, where does this thing live? Um, I don't know. I guess I'm supposed to use the word anima. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an anima. It's a homotopy type. It's a simplicial set. It's a topological space. These are all different words for kind of the same thing here, except I'm not, not supposed to use the word topological space anymore. Um, <laughs> I'm being recorded, so you know I don't know what uh, you know. <laughs> um, okay, but so here, but and another name, of course, the name I, I prefer for this is BZ. Um, so it's <laughs> so rather than two points and two arrows, you can think of it as one point and one loop. It's the classifying space of the of the circle. Uh, so I like to study BZ, and um, it's so this is so this is the kind that's a better intuition when you say S1. This S1 really has relatively little to do with GM. I mean, if you like, it has to do with the homotopy type of GM. It's not the algebraic object GM. It's more like BZ. It's a classifying stack of, this, of, the, of the integers. And you can, yeah, no, absolutely. You can definitely think of the derived tensor product. Well, that's right. But you, know, but, but, you know, but you already heard the beginning of my talk when I said that the whole point was about circle actions. So if I think about this derived tensor product, if I think about the complex of differential forms, I don't see any symmetry. But if I think about this as maps from S1 to X, if I just use this notation, whatever it means, it's clear that you know, if this S1 is a group, this group acts. So S1 as a group object in whatever world this is will act on this mapping space. And the wonderful thing that was discovered by Kahn and Fagan Sigan, not in this language, was that that action, so you ask, what does that mean to give an action of S1 on something like that? So Kahn formalized this in the language of cyclic objects. Um, but you can just spell out what that means very concretely. That, so, so yeah, so what does it mean to have a circle action? And there's kind of two manifestations. And I, it's hard for me to keep them both in my head at once, but there's kind of two versions. So what does it mean for a circle action to act, say, on 
um, say, let's say to act on x, a scheme, and let me, might as well assume it's affine, let me just think of it as being spec of r, some ring. Um, what it means is really, so you say, okay, the circle is this abstract guy, let me linearize it. It has a linearization, which is, um, well, okay, let me just write it. So you have this algebra. So it's a, when you have an act, what does it mean to act a group on something? You should think of an action of the corresponding group algebra, a module for the group algebra. So I need to tell you, what do I mean when I say an S1 action? What kind of group algebra am I allowed to take? And I said S1 you should think of as a homotopic object. So you're not allowed to think of like smooth functions or any kind of functions like that. You need to have some homotopic functions. Um, so my, or distributions for the group algebra, and this is my group algebra. So chains on the circle, or if you like in characteristic zero, I might as well just think of homology of the circle. It has a convolution product. This is the group algebra of the circle. And so what this means is an action. It just means that R is acted on by this DGA. Well, it's actually differential uh, DGA with no differential, which is just a thing. This is just means an action of this corresponds to um, uh, degree minus one derivation. That's all it means. You have this algebra chains over the circle. It's generated by the fundamental class of the circle uh, with square zero. It's kind of square zero. So you have just a single operator of, of square zero. Which is, What's the multiplication of square zero? Uh, well, it's, it's the group algebra operation, right? So it's, 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 um, it's I guess, called Pontryagin product, right? So if I have a map from G cross G to G, I can push forward. So it's just convolution, right? So, so I have chains on, on G, tensor chains on G goes to chains on G by push, by push forward. I mean, this for the entire complex of chains. I'm just saying that the chain, let's just forget about chains, the homology. Homology of a, of a topological group is, is always an associative algebra, which in the discrete case is, is the group algebra of that finite group, of the discrete group. So I think it's the group operation That's, one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, so the point is that what, and what Kahn discovered is that, so all you're looking for is a single operator of degree minus one, but notice that I put differential forms in negative degrees. So there's a natural thing of degree minus one, namely the Durand differential. Uh, I think you said it, but yeah. would you should write. Would you have to write it? Yeah, so, so it looks like you know, k of eta, uh, eta squared, where degree of eta is minus one. Um, so it's just a single operator which is if you like integrating over a circle uh, on differential forms, it's a single operator of degree minus one with squares to zero. And so this, when if you take R in the case where R was differential forms, this action of the circle is just given by the Duram differential. This is Kahn's interpretation. This is what cyclic homology is about. The Duram differential can be interpreted as this S1 action. Okay, so you know, at this point, um, you sh should complain, and you have a perfectly right to complain. I'm going very, very far to just tell you about the Duram differential, right? You already knew the Duram differential. You didn't need all of this to tell you the Duram differential. Similarly, you don't need all of this to tell you D modules. I can, I can, um, but let me still do it. Let me still tell you how to say D modules in this language. Um, and so let me, um, let me say a couple of things. So if I give you a group, you know, if I give you a, if I have a group acting on a, on a vector space over K, um, then if I look at the invariance, right, that's hom from the trivial representation to V, this carries an action of endomorphisms of the trivial. Um, and, um, and since I am cheating and everything is derived, this is really um, co-chains on BG. Okay, so when you take invariance in the derived setting, um, you, you get an act, if you like, this is a usual Hecke algebra pattern. We, we're familiar with what acts on invariance. There's something that acts, which is if you like, this is G mod G mod G. That's what acts on the invariance. Um, so in the case of the circle, 
when I take invariance for this circle action, I'll get an action. So if G is my S1, this cochains on BG, that's cochains on the cohomology of CP infinity, um, which is polynomials in a variable U of degree two. Okay. So if I have a circle action in this sense, if I take equivariant objects, I'm going to get things that are linear. I'm going to get this parameter U. Okay. Um, so, sorry, I forgot again when I'm supposed to end. 25. Okay. Um, so, so it, now if I give you, um, if similarly, if, if you have a group acting on a category, which is a K linear category, and I take the uh, equivariant object, these are the you know, equivariant object, uh, this is going to be linear again over the same ring over this cohomology of BG. In general, it's not. That, uh, in general, it's not at all a full subcategory. I mean, in fact, it never basically. Never, yeah. Sorry. And the question was, is this a full, is this a full subcategory? And the answer is essentially never. Yeah. So this is more structure, and this is an object together with the diagram of equivariance. So you have identifications of you know pullback and projection. Uh, let, let me cheat. One answer is that, you know, I said there's two ways to think of the circle. There's a way of thinking about the circle as this differential. It's coming from this homology. The other way is to just think of it as BZ. An action of a circle, so S1 acting on a category, this is BZ. So what does it mean for BZ to act on a category? It means an automorphism, an automorphism of the identity functor. So that's a, a, a different kind of flavor takes, if you'd like. Uh, but you have an automorphism of the identity functor. And so these are objects together with the trivialization of that automorphism. That's what equivalence means. Um, OK, so now, um, so now, uh, so about Jean-Francois' question about full subcategory, um, of course, you know, it's not at all a full subcategory in general, but something cool happens for the circle is that the trivial representation, the Hecke algebra for the trivial representation is sort of smart enough. In other words, what do I mean by that? Uh, you know, if I have a Hecke algebra, the best thing I could hope is, you know, some representations generated by their invariance would be equivalent to modules for the Hecke algebra. In this case, I have um, that if, uh, if V carries an, a vector space with a circle action, and I take V in invariant objects. So now that's a module for uh, this polynomials in U, this cochain on BS1, this polynomials in U. Um, I can then try to go the adjoint functor. I could take the invariance and I can tensor over K of U with K. I can set U to zero. So I set U equals zero. And the beautiful thing, which is special to, I mean, somehow because the group is connected, this is total nonsense for finite group, this is isomorphic to V. So if you like the category of represent, everything is generated by the trivial representation, and you're just equivalent to, to modules for this Hecke algebra. So this is, a, if you like, Goreski, Kotwitz, and McPherson version of causal duality. Um, so, the, so the point is that in the case of circle actions, you can actually set U to zero and recover the original vector space from what, where you wanted. Um, so in this case of categories with the circle action, if C, if S1 acts on a category, then I could take C S1, this is now K of U linear category. And if I set U to zero, um, you might have hoped to get back where you started, but sadly you don't quite, but you do get a full subcategory. So on level of vector spaces, which is on level of homs, taking S1 invariance is kind of painless. You can undo it if you remember this action. On level of category, some objects just won't be seen by, will not talk to equivariant objects at all. You just take, take the circle acting on itself, for example. You'll see, you know, so there might not be a lot of equivariant objects, but 
you, you get a full subcategory out of this out of this picture. So let me call this the S1 invariance. Just to give it a name. This so, so, yeah. I'm very confused. You first set up you, you have G act on G, so V makes <coughs> in some stable integrated category. But, but later you G acts on, on this category thing, but but the category of K-linear categories is only semi-additive. So somehow, I, I don't understand how you, because it's The additivity is not necessary for, to talk about, act, so the question was, how, what do I mean by circle action on a category where I understand in a linear setting, but you can talk about a group acting on a category, the category doesn't have to have any linearity property. Here it's really a topological object, a topological group can act on any, any infinity category of any yeah, kind. Yeah, but, but my confusion is that how, how you, you, you get, get an action of a non-connective thing, I mean, because your C star of, of, of this, that, that is not connected. I mean, I mean, in semi-additive setup, I don't see how. I mean. It's just it just means it's linear. I, I mean, you, get, you can talk about notion of a category linear over any ring, added, you know, connective or not. You have a commutative ring. You can t talk about a category being linear over that commutative ring. It just means the Hom spaces are enriched in in, in modules. Um, so okay. Um, so now I'm sure I've lost people again. So let me, let me just write some statements. Um, OK. I guess I'm, I'm going to miss my main punchline, but that's, that's OK. Um, so what, so the state, what, here's a kind of statement. And there's a theorem. And this theorem you can think of as being very formal. as just kind of reinterpretation of all this kind of, de, of this cyclic homology story. Uh, it appears in a paper of mine and, and David Nadler, uh, and also in work of Toen and Vitsozzi around the same time. And for singular schemes, this, it was extended by, by Pregel, so I don't need to write x smooth. And it says that if I look at coherent sheaves on this derived loop space, so here x is a scheme. And let me remind you that this derived loop space is really just an annoying name for this shifted tangent bundle, which is just an annoying name for differential forms. Uh, but now if I take circle equivariant, um, that this is the same as, as filtered D modules. Uh, but let me just, rather than doing the filtered version, we're maybe more familiar with just ordinary D modules. So if I tensor with this K of U, let's invert U. So think of this as the S1 Tate construction, and inverting this equivariant parameter. What I get is just D modules. Well, except the D modules didn't have this annoying U parameter in them, so I just add it by hand. So you can get D modules out of coherent sheaves by this circle action. This is a fancy way of saying, look at coherent sheaves, add the action of the DRAM differential. You're looking at DG modules for the DRAM complex. That's what D modules are. Um, so again, I, 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 so far I've been spending a lot of time of derived algebraic geometry, and I'm just telling you things you already know, or in a very complicated way. So let me just finish with uh, why is this a useful point of view? And the thing that makes this useful is that we're, we're going to take x is now going to be a stack. And I say, OK, things are going to get much worse. But they're going to get much more interesting in interesting ways. So for example, so first of all, the stacks I'm going to care about are going to be finite orbit stacks, like you know, quotient of a nice smooth scheme, say, by a group with finitely many orbits. If it's a finite orbit stack, then this derived loop space nonsense will not be derived. There'll be nothing derived about it. It'll be an ordinary algebraic stack. So the spaces I'm going to be talking about are not going to be derived, unlike the case of a scheme. So the content is going to be very different. So what, again, loop space, what is this derived loop space? Loop space, again, I defined it as maps from a circle, or if you'd like, a self-intersection of the diagonal. What does mean self-intersection of diagonal? It means a point together with an automorphism. So this is just what's known as the inertia stack. Given a stack, you can talk about the inertia stack. It's a point together with an automorphism. It's a collection of all the inertia groups. So in general, if x is you know, not a finite orbit stack, this will be a derived version of the inertia stack. But in our setting, it literally is just going to be the naive thing you write down, a 
point with an automorphism. <laughs> now, um, so maybe to write down an example, the only example, no, here's one example is just to write down x to be, um, so if you take x, what's my favorite stack? It's point mod a group. And then this derived loop space maps from a circle to point mod g just means g local systems on the circle. So, and so that means I have a single element of g, which is the monodromy as I go around the circle up to conjugation. Okay. So that's what this, this is the prototypical example of a derived loop space. Or if you want another example, so I could write down lots of examples that appeared in the talk at the beginning. They won't have, a, I don't have much time. But for example, if you look at this kind of stack, double cosets for the Borel, then you get a version of the Steinberg variety. You get a group element in G and two flags uh, such that G sits in the intersections. That's the kind of a, a version of the Steinberg variety up to the group. So that's the kind of space that we're getting in, loops, in the case of loop spaces. Um, the space of Unipon Langland's parameters that appeared in the talk also appears naturally as a, essentially as a loop space. Uh, I don't know if I should write that down. Okay, maybe I should write that down. If you take the nilpotent cone of a Lie algebra and you mod out by the group, but also by GM. I'm gonna throw in this extra GM rescaling the nilpotent cone. If I take the loop space, I get um, I get basically this set of, of tame parameters. I get an element G in G, Q in GM, uh, N in the nilpotent cone, such that G N equals Q N up to conjugation. So the space of uniform Langlands parameters is essentially a loop space. Okay. So the unfortunately I'm kind of oh I'm already past time. So I'm sorry? Oh, I just meant the adjoint action. I don't know. Add G of, of N. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, G acting on N. Um, so the first message to say is that loop spaces appear very naturally. Spaces of Langlands parameters tend to have S1 actions on them. Um, and since I'm out of time, I won't give examples. The next thing to say is that when you do this S1 localization on these space of Langlands parameters, you exactly go from these categories of coherent sheaves by a version of that theorem. You go to categories of constructible sheaves. So can you write this yeah. how this I mean, I'm over time, but the, an organizer just asked me a question. So I said, <laughs> you, you asked this. I apologize to those who did not want to hear this. Um, let me just write down what, let me just write down the following simple thing, which is Jordan decomposition for a group. So if I look at um, G mod G, right? This, this is the loop space of X in the case of X is BG. So this is gonna be my LX. Uh, that has a map to, you know, the adjoint quotient or, you know, Cartan mod W, okay? Um, now, inside of here, I have the formal completion of the loop space along constant loops. That's again something you can define in general. In this case, it's just if you like the formal group, or if you like exp of the Lie algebra mod G. Um, so that's something I can do in general. Uh, the claim is that if you do this S1 localization story on here, you're going to get D modules. The same theorem that I stated up there works for stacks if you put in formal loop spaces. Now that's not so useful still, but here's the cool thing. And, and the cool thing is there's this. In the middle, I'm going to just move that. Uh, there's a beautiful theorem of Harrison Chen in his thesis. So uh, Chen, there's a theorem which is called Jordan decomposition. That's not the paper. Uh, the theorem has, is Jordan decomposition of loops. And it gives a version of Jordan decomposition for, let me say, the usual Jordan decomposition, and his generalizes it. So if I take the class of a semi-simple element in here, and I look at its formal neighborhood, the no formal neighborhood of a semi-simple element. So that's what happens when I fix parameters. So what happens here? Well, you have a semi-simple element and you have automorphisms, things that commute with it. 
Um, so the claim is what you get here is something that you might call, the, what we, Nadler and I defined as the unipotent loop space of X. This is something you can define in general. I, let me not give the formula. It makes sense for any stack. There's something called the unipotent loop space, which in this case just means you look at the, the centralizer of S and you look at unipotent elements, things formally close, formal neighborhood of unipotent elements, mod, mod the group. Or, so in other words, this unipotent loop space of X, uh, sorry, of X, S, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to go too fast. So what I want to say is that if you pick a parameter, so let me st state the Jordan decomposition theorem. So if you look at the inverse image, inverse image in LX of the formal neighborhood of a semi-simple element, yeah, I don't know, formal neighborhood of the class. S is an element of semi-simple element of the group. I'm looking at the formal neighborhood of the semi-simple element. It's identified with the unipotent loop space of the um, fixed points of S mod the centralizer of S. Okay, so this is a, and this is true for any X where X is, you know, say an F, let's say a scheme mod, an, mod a reductive group. So here it's say a scheme, and here I have a reductive group, so I can make sense of all these words. So the, the cool thing, so here just I'm finished with this last sentence, right? That what happens is S1 equivariant sheaves on loop spaces are much more interesting than D modules. They have this cool dependence on parameters. If you fix those parameters, one parameter at a time, you get a much simpler space, this thing called a unipotent loop space, where the same naive picture holds. So we prove that the S1 localization story on unipotent loop space, it just gives D module. So when you take this unipotent loop space and do S1 equivariant sheaves, you get D modules on X, D modules on this XS. So that's exactly the pattern that's going on here. You look at coherent sheaves here, you do S1 localization, one parameter at a time, you're getting these, not loop spaces, but these unipotent loop spaces, and you get exactly categories of D module. So that's the mechanism that relates it to. So I'm happy to say a lot more in, well, in Q&A, but I, I should really stop.